Good morning, everyone. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Doesn't it look beautiful up here? Thanks to everyone that decorated. Just seeing Christmas lights puts me in the mood. I'm ready. Where's my gifts? Anybody give me gifts? <laughs> Let's all stand this morning. We're going to do some, we do some Christmas mashups is what I call them. You, as you know, I've been, we've been here four years now, and I'm not a big fan of Christmas music. Forgive me, Lord. But um, we'll do more on our Christmas day. So we're going to do these little mashups that kind of mash praise and worship and Christmas together. So they're easy. Let's sing. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Give him all you got this morning. He's faithful. Aren't you glad of that? Whatever you're going through this morning, he's faithful then and he'll be faithful today. Sometimes we remember how faithful he was and then we forget how faithful he can be sometimes. Amen. But he's there for us this morning. Touch your people today, Jesus. I am holding on. Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall Forever. 
as I interest I depend on you I depend on you for tired of that song, that He is our life, that everything that we are, we draw from Him, that we're just a branch and He's the vine, that we get our life from Him, we get our joy from Him, we get our peace from Him, our strength from Him, and that over and over and over again, we have the temptation to try to draw from something else, another source, that He is the only way, He is the only giver of life. As we go to the Lord in prayer, let's please remember Lynette, she's been having one thing after another. She had to go to urgent care a couple of times this week. So let's keep her in prayer. Let's also keep Tim Patterson in prayer. He is the one who had the accident on 104 last night. Just kind of confirmed that this morning. He's okay. Everybody's okay. So we rejoice in that. But we want to keep them in prayer. Uh, And as always, let's pray that our hearts be prepared to receive. And that we uh, pray for our one, the person in our life, more than any other, that we desire to come to Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you and we pray because you are our source. You are the source of all good things. You are the one who answers our prayers. You're the one who hears our prayers. You're the one who can do all things. Nothing, nothing is impossible with you. We pray for a special touch on Lynette. We thank you for keeping Tim safe last night and those other involved in the accident. We just pray for their their, their full recovery and for the loss of Uh, the animals, Lord God, we just pray for that as well. You know that you care about the the big things and the little things, all things in our life. We pray that during this service that our hearts will not be hardened, but will be fertile to receive the word as it is scattered, that it will find good soil and bear fruit in our life. And as always, we call out the name of our one, name, Lord God, that we've been praying for, the name that we desire to come into a relationship with you, to know you, to call you Lord, to call you Savior, to attach to the vine. I call out the name of Aladdin and I pray that wherever he is this morning, whatever he may be doing, that he will sense you with him, that you will send people to him or you will remind him of things spoken in the past and bring forth a harvest of salvation in his life. We pray this for every name, every person. And again, we expect, Lord God, that one by one, people will begin to call upon your name, be saved, and we will join in with heaven and rejoice that those who were lost have been found. In Jesus' holy name, and the church said, amen and amen. You might be seated. Seated. going to continue our worship as we enter into communion and as always in communion we are warned to have the right heart that we are not to take of this meal that Jesus invites us to casually we're not to do this half-heartedly we're not to do this unless we are born again 
children of God. Now, to take this meal, I've, I've explained many times, to take it worthily does not mean that we are without sin. Because if we have to be without sin to take this meal, then we will never, ever be able to take it until we are in heaven. But we have been invited, and the only reason that we can come, and the only reason that we can do this, is that we have received an invitation from the guest of honor, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 and 29, we receive a warning from the Apostle Paul. He says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone, everyone, every person, every pastor, every elder, every usher, everyone, ought to examine themselves, not examine someone else, examine yourself before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, without remembering, without thinking about Jesus, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So let's take a moment to reflect, to examine ourselves, to ensure that we can do this with the utmost respect, with the utmost reverence, and remembering what Jesus did for us. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for so, so much. For willfully coming, being sent by the Father, and paying the price for our redemption. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for your body that was broken, the blood that was spilled. We pray that you will bless these elements, and as we take this, we will do so with the right heart remembering what you did, remembering that we are a body, we are a family, and remembering that one day you will return and bring us to where you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ushers, you can come. come again coming from the outside returning from the inside people on this side please watch the the advent candle
Has everyone been served? Anyone? Of course, the bread, we know, represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians, again, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. The wine or the juice, of course, represents the blood of our Savior. Paul continues in saying, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Lord Jesus, we can never thank you enough. No matter how many times we do this, no matter how many times we're invited to this table, we can never remember enough, we can never thank you enough, we can never worship you enough. Sometimes we make our salvation such a small thing, not realizing what we were destined to before you came into our life. What awaited us before you came and made reconciliation between us and God. And we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord God, that we will remember you not only when we take this meal, but every day of our life, every waking moment, we will realize who we are because we are in you and you are in us and what has been done for us, not because of our own merit, but because of your amazing love. In Jesus' name we pray. And we want to continue our worship in the gifts of giving of tithes and offerings. So, ushers, you can come. As always, we want to emphasize we give unto the Lord. We do not give to a church, a denomination, or a person. We're giving to God. We do so because we love and appreciate Him. We do so because we're thankful that everything we have is for Him and by Him. We give the tithe because it is a return that He has requested commanded to be returned to him. The offering is anything above the tithe that is given for things as missions, building fund, or whatever it may be. But all of it is counted as unto the Lord for his kingdom and for his purpose as a gift of love and appreciation and thanksgiving. And also though, we're promised because God is such a giving God that as we give he will take care of us. He will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that all that we have is by your hand. And I just pray, Lord God, as we return to that to you, which you request, and given above that in the offering, you will use it for your glory, for your purpose, and your plan. And we just pray, Lord God, that your kingdom will come and your will be done in our lives, in our church, in our community, and on this planet as it is in heaven. In Christ's name, amen. so much for your giving. We want to welcome you to Kincaid Church of God. If you're watching online, we want to welcome you as well. We also want to encourage you to like, share, comment uh, in, on Facebook so that we can spread the word of God to those in your feed and those of, of your friends list. Uh, this morning, I, I don't normally do this, but I've been given a special request to embarrass someone. <laughs> so I'm going to embarrass a few people while I have the opportunity this coming Friday, I've been told, is Daniel's birthday. <laughs> I don't know how old he is because I can't count that high. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
Also, Thursday is Kendra's birthday. She will be 16. No, she's not getting her driver's license. Why? Because I am smart, all right? Uh, <laughs> trust me, you don't want my, you don't one of my kids to drive. <laughs> they can't even drive a golf cart, all right? Uh, also, last week was Jeremy's birthday <laughs> and Ren's birthday. So, did anybody else have a birthday recently? Oh, yeah, right. Who? Who? Oh, okay. This Friday or last Friday? How old are you? Okay. So, I am not about to start singing happy birthday because I would like for you to stay for the sermon. <laughs> so, I would like someone else to start and I might join in, all right? <laughs> all right. So, those of you who have a birthday, except Ren because she's a little shy, stand up. Jeremy's going to use the excuse that he's playing the keyboard. So, <laughs> so let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. That's it. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. yeah, I can never sing again. <laughs> That's okay, I know. God likes my singing. He's the only one. So, uh, again, I don't do that normally. But if you ever want me to embarrass somebody in your family that's here and has a birthday, just let me know. We'll do that. So, it's not that I don't uh, care. It's a thing of I just, those things are, they're just not up here. I'm sorry. They're not in here. They're, they're just not. Uh, I mean, I know my own kid's birthday because I, I realize I'm about to spend a lot of money. So, other than that, I don't really uh think about it. So just a few announcements. First of all, we want to thank everyone who come and decorated for Christmas. We want to thank you for that. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, I mean, as you can see, I'm a, I, I don't really give them much direction. I just emphasize moderation. And uh, I mean, I know my mother is like a Christmas nut. I remember she used to decorate like the laundry room, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, maybe that's why I'm not as fond uh, of it. But uh, it's not that I don't like it. I think it's beautiful. It's just I want to it to. Uh... Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, just some announcements. The manger offering will be December seventeenth and December twenty fourth. Uh, uh, Dave, <laughs> Jamie's Dave, the one with hair, uh, has made us is making us three mangers. I'm trying to figure out how to identify them because both their wives start their letter and their names start with a J, and I mean it's just crazy. Uh, but he's made us some mangers that we're going to have. We're going to have three mangers up here. And on those two dates, uh, other than the tithes and offerings or anything you designate for missions or anything, the, all the offering will go to our children's ministry to cover their expenses for next year. And uh, this is just a way that because the children can't do fundraisers, that we can raise money for them. And again, uh, Lisa, Lisa is just doing such a tremendous job in all her helpers and all the people who work with her. I'm just so, so pleased in, in their efforts. Uh, also, on December 17th is the children's Christmas service. And is the, yeah, in the, in the dinner. This is, we'll be, we'll be having the Christmas plays and all the things. I don't even know what they're doing, all the things. I, I think the drama they're doing this year was actually written by the pastor's wife that we worked with in Dubai. And so uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of really you know, excited about it just because uh, Divya, our pastor's wife there, the person, people that we worked with, she, she wrote this herself. And it is just, you know, we thought it would be kind of a nice thing to do. We do want you to register for you and as any guest, family you, you, you know will be here on the, on the uh, church app or in the back so that we will have a good number to tell the caterer uh, about how many we're going to have for dinner that day, uh, for lunch that day, okay? And then there will be a Christmas Eve service, and I want to make this clear because, there were, you know, is that it will be the same morning service, okay? Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, so at 1030, it'll be about 1030 to 1130. I will, I will, we will do like we did Christmas last year. I know this is a day of family. It is also a day that we celebrate the incarnation or the preparation for that. But we will have a service. We're not going to do anything that night. And so uh, this will also be the day that we do the candlelight service. 
uh, together. So the whole service will be about an hour, and that's it. And then you can be with your family, and I think that's important. Uh, I've had a lot of pastors tell me that Christmas evening services are very well attended and all that kind of thing. I'm just not going to take you away from your family. You can, we can celebrate it uh, on Sunday morning just as much as we can on Sunday night. Okay, uh, Our memory verse for today. And oh, also, at the end of the service, please be sure we have a small devotional book for the month of December. It is a Christmas devotional uh, that we'll be giving everyone. And so please be, make sure you can take one, and everyone can get one, not just one per family, everyone. Because actually, for some reason, they sent them to us twice. <laughs> so we have a lot of them. So uh, we're going to uh, pass those out at the end of the service. Our memory verse is Galatians chapter 4. What? Somebody said that. Verses 4 and 5. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. And this is also our uh, main text for today. Again, the cards are in the back if you are collecting the cards. If not, the memory verse is also listed on the note sheet. So children, you can come forward. for our children. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for our children, and we thank you for those who serve them and minister to them through your word. I pray, Lord God, that you will be with them, and you will help them and encourage them, help them to understand, and help them to develop a love for you and, and, and just a, a knowledge of you that they can carry with them for the rest of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In case you're wondering, they're preparing for the Christmas play on the 17th. That's why everybody's leaving. Or that should be why everybody's leaving. I hope my, I hope my one lyric and happy birthday didn't do that much damage. I have sang in church from a microphone once in my whole life. And trust me, it was God-inspired <laughs> uh, once. And I hope it's never inspired again. So... It was, because the, it was because the very young minister team, music minister team that we had in Dubai did not, I, I told them to sing the original uh, Amazing Grace, <laughs> and they sung the one from about 15 years ago. That's kind of the, the generational gap that we have, and I'm like, oh, that's not the original one. But anyway, anyway, as we approach Christmas, we want to focus on what Christmas is truly about. And so we're going to do a little two-sermon series. If it, I, don't, I don't really call two sermons a series, but then this week and next week uh, called Considering Christmas. And with the amount of gatherings and gifts and decorations, it's very, very easy that we forget what we're celebrating as we celebrate Christmas, that we're celebrating the incarnation of God. So again, this week and next week, we're going to take an in-depth look into what the Incarnation really means and what we should be reflecting on and thinking about as we celebrate Christmas. Now, I'm going to encourage you to stay awake. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to uh, pay attention because I was really, really concerned. One of the reasons I didn't come up here to help people decorate yesterday is I was really concerned with this sermon that it be understood and that I can explain it well enough that you can understand it because we're going to go into some little bit of some complicated subjects like the Trinity and other things. And so I, I encourage you to, to stay awake. So if you want to poke the person in, beside you, if you know them, <laughs> by, in the ribs, just to keep them awake, you can do that. I also always want to welcome you to come and talk to me, to text or whatever. If you have questions, if you seek clarification of something from the sermon, or you want to discuss something in the scriptures, or you just merely have questions. Uh, I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. Please don't think that I'm too busy or whatever. Also, please don't think I work one day a week. <laughs> but you know, please don't think that. One of the things that I actually miss of our time in Dubai 
was every, almost every day, people in our church there would send questions as they would study the Bible that they would want to ask and seek clarification of things that I may have said or just things in their own private study. And I want to welcome, you don't have to do that, but I want to welcome you to do that. But any time that we go into the Scripture, any time that we read the Bible or study the Bible, it is very, very wise to ask questions, okay? We need to ask questions like simple questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how? Okay, these are basic research questions, basic study questions that we should ask any time we're studying and reading the Bible. We should also ask the reflection questions of, God, what are you trying to say to me through what I'm reading? Are you trying to reveal something to me about yourself, about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Are you trying to reveal something to me about myself? Are you trying to, trying to show me my sin? Are you trying to encourage me or lift me up? Are you trying to give me some sort of guidance? I mean, these are all questions that we should be asking when we read or study the Bible. So as we go into it, let's pray our prayer that we pray, asking that we will encounter Christ as we go into his word. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself with your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior. And make the book Live to me for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, understanding the Bible is crucial in successfully navigating the Christian life. It is what makes the, this, the time that we live in one of the most dangerous times in the history of Christianity because it is said that we live in the most biblically illiterate time in all the history of the church. That more people who claim to be Christian do not know the basic things of the scripture, that they don't read the scripture, they don't study the scripture, and they don't understand the scripture. But it is, in, it is crucial that we have understanding of the Bible if we want to live as Christians. And before we go into the word, we need to always remember, always remember, whether you're reading the word in a devotion or whether you're reading it, just trying to read through it or you're trying to study it, every time you go into this book, you need to remember that this whole book is about Jesus. Not just the New Testament, not just the Gospels, the entire book is about Christ from beginning to end. In the Old Testament, Jesus is predicted. In the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. In the Acts of the Apostles, Jesus is preached. In the epistles or the letters in the Bible, Jesus is explained. And in Revelation, Jesus is expected. So the Old Testament, he is predicted. The Gospels, he is revealed. The Acts of the Apostles, he is preached. The Epistles, or the letters, he is explained. And in Revelation, he is expected. And the Old and New Testaments are kind of like a two-act play. Now, you might be surprised, for those of you who know me, I actually really, really, really enjoy plays. Okay? I haven't got to go in many in my life, but I enjoy plays. I enjoy, I, I enjoy good plays. Uh, I remember very clearly one time when, we, when Carrie and I were at Lee, Lee was doing a, a, a play on the crucifixion, and we went the night they were actually filming it. So if they ever messed up during the play, they would stop and do it again. <laughs> and it wasn't very entertaining because they kept stopping. I mean, one time Jesus fell off the cross and had to get back on it. And, you know, and kind of the joke was, Jesus loved us so much, he got back up there, you know. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, a really good play, two-act play, I mean, I enjoy that. However, if you go to a two-act play and you only go to the second act, you're going to be the one who asks all those annoying questions to the people who've been there the whole time. You know, those questions of, who is this person? What does this mean? Why is this happening? You know, kind of the questions that sometimes you hear in movie theaters to someone who don't pay attention. Yeah, some of you have watched movies. I better be quiet. I'm going to get myself in trouble. Stop that right there. I was going to say it with your wife, but never mind. So, The people around you would say, hey, if you would have came for the first act, then you would understand. In the same way, if you only come, if you come to the first act, but then you don't stay for the second act, you will be the person who is equally annoying, asking all your friends the next day, well, what happened? How did it end? Well, in ways... The Old Testament and the New Testament are like a two-act play. You need to have understanding of both if you're going to understand how they fit together, if you're going to understand the whole story. If you only read the New Testament 
You're not going to understand why things are happening. And if you only read and study the Old Testament, you won't know how it all ends. And sadly, sadly, there are many people who see the Bible as just a bunch of pieces of a puzzle that don't go together. They feel hopeless to understand it. They'll they'll look at things in the Bible and say, I don't know what this is or where it goes. I can't put all this together. It, It doesn't make any sense at all to me when they read the Bible. And because they're unable to put the pieces together, they think obviously there's no relevance to them in their life. So they don't read it at all. And obviously many Christians are in that position today. They think the Bible is just a bis, you know, disconnected group of pieces of a puzzle that they are just hopeless to put them all together. But nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible is perfectly coherent, perfectly interconnected. It fits. And the more you study it, the more you read it, and the more you learn what the text is really saying, the more you will see how it all fits together. Despite being a book, that contains 66 different books written by approximately 40 authors from different backgrounds, different cultures, and even different languages over a period of 1,500 years. It fits together perfectly. There is a story written over the whole of the Bible which we can only understand, you will only understand if you read it and study it through the pictures of Jesus Christ, by the person of Christ. In eternity, God determined that he would purchase a people for himself. And the Bible is the unfolding of the plan of that purchase of redemption. The Bible is far from being a bunch of pieces that seem impossible to put together, but where we find that the sovereign God of the universe... The one who created everything is orchestrating everything, including the revealing of himself, according to this perfect, perfect plan. God is in control. God knows what's happening. Nothing ever surprises him, ever. Now, it might surprise you. It might surprise your family, but it doesn't surprise God. Now, I bring this up because we're preparing to celebrate Christmas. And many people do not understand how the Christmas piece fits into the puzzle. Okay? They think it's disconnected from everything else in the Bible. Also, many think that the Christmas story stands disconnected from their own life. I mean, why does the Christmas story matter to your life at Thursday at 3 o'clock in July? Now, Kendra enjoys jigsaw puzzles. Now, while I will sit down with her, because I want to spend time with her to do a jigsaw puzzle, I don't particularly enjoy jigsaw puzzles. I don't. It's not one of my favorite things to do. Now, when I'm in the store and I see the pretty picture on the box, I often think, oh, how nice it would be to put together that puzzle until I dump all the pieces on the table, and then I change my opinion. What looks so wonderful on the cover, what looks so wonderful on the box, suddenly looks so chaotic and so disorganized. And usually after getting a few pieces together, I'm done. I'll just watch her do the puzzle. You see, the thing with jigsaw puzzles is that it doesn't matter if you do manage to get a few pieces together if you don't understand how they fit into the picture as a whole. And just because you get nine or ten pieces together and maybe you see some, you know, a part of a mountain or a bird or a rainbow or a house, unless you know how it fits into the overall puzzle, it really, really doesn't matter very much. And you'll give up because you, know, you have no idea how this fits together, and you put the puzzle away in despair until the next foolish time you're at Walmart and buy another one. Many of us, many Christians see the Bible this way, especially Christmas. It seems to be a piece of the puzzle that for many people doesn't seem to fit. 
And the result of this type of thinking is that Christmas becomes disconnected from the overall story that we see in the Bible. Christmas becomes just a sentimental time of year where we have good feelings. It's why so many non-Christians can actually still celebrate Christmas is because we have made it just a sentimental time every year. And, and, and also because of this, many people think Scrooge is right. You know, I don't know if you know who Ebenezer Scrooge is. I hope you do. <laughs> I can understand when I would mention that in Dubai. Nobody would understand. I hope you understand. Some of you just think, I mean, some people just think that Christmas is just all humbug, just like Christmas, you know, the Scrooge. That it's good for kids, it's good for grandmas to spoil the kids, but ultimately it is totally irrelevant to my life. I mean, what does a baby in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago have to do with my life today? It is simply a disconnected, unrelated, useless piece of information, a piece of a puzzle that doesn't fit. Many people may think that Christmas is just an appeal for money, where the stores get you to buy gifts and treats and decorations, where toy stores especially make a bundle. The Salvation Army rings their bell to get you put money in the pot. Churches have manger offerings. Everybody this time of year just wants money for one thing or another. And they do their best to make you feel guilty enough so that you will give. Like the cold guy in the Salvation Army outside that cold store ringing his bell. And you just got out of your warm car and you're rushing towards the store. And you have that little clicker and you click and you hear boop boop. That little noise you hear and you think you're just so swell. And you get to the guy freezing his rear end off ringing the bell. And then you throw some money in his pot because you feel guilty. You're celebrating Christmas. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's what we do. We put up a bunch of decorations, we sing a few songs, we go into debt to buy gifts, we eat until we can't walk, we try to be a little bit nicer, and we think that's what Christmas is all about. The Christmas spirit, if you will. Spend, give, eat, and be nicer, for, and then be a jerk for the rest of the year. I mean, is that what Christmas means to us? Is it what it means to you? Let me share with you this morning, Christmas is not all of this. And Christmas is definitely not an appeal. Christmas is an announcement. Good news, great joy for all the world. You say, what good news? What is the announcement? What does Christmas really mean and how does it fit in, not only to the Bible, but in my life? I mentioned before that the epistles or the letters in the New Testament are explanations of Jesus as he was revealed in the Gospels. And when you read the epistles, there are sometimes verses that stand as summarizing statements for the whole story of Christ. One of those summarizing statements is our memory verse, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. That's the gospel right there. That's the Bible right there. But you might look at that and say, what does that mean? I mean, isn't that just another piece of a big puzzle that I don't understand? I mean, Vance, why don't you just talk about Bethlehem, enjoy the baby in the manger, sing Silent Night, let's drink some cocoa and go home. But if we will just take the time to think about this carefully, we will begin to see why Christmas matters in the whole story of the Bible and our life. And we will realize that Christmas is ultimately an offer, an announcement of an offer that God is making to us. Christmas is an offer of the incredible gift from God to humanity. So as we go into this text, we're going to look, we're going to look at this text in Galatians 4. I really need a bigger pulpit <laughs> or a smaller Bible, but if I have a smaller Bible, I won't be able to read it. So okay. I've hit that age. I can't go any bigger print than this, and then I'm in trouble. <laughs> but in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, we're going to ask those questions. Of who, what, when, where, why, and how, okay? 
first question we're going to ask is when. Galatians 4, 4, the first part. When? When the time, when the set time had fully come. Okay? When the set time had fully come. When did Jesus come? When the set time had fully come. Okay? There are those, and maybe even some of the people in this room, who think Jesus came at the wrong time. That Jesus, I mean, why did you come, you know, in this ancient land in which transportation and all that was, you know, you had to ride donkeys and camels and all this kind of stuff. Why didn't you come when we have the internet and texting and, and, and satellites and television and all this? Why not come then, you know? Why did you come when you came? I mean, what does it mean when the set time had fully come? What does set time mean? It means at the moment God determined in his eternal plan. Jesus' coming was not on a whim. Jesus' coming was not arbitrary. It was not random. It was not spontaneous. Jesus didn't come too early, and Jesus didn't come too late. He came when the set time for him to come had been established by God in God's plan. When the set time had come. And we see this in many other places in Scripture. One of those places is Romans 5 and 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It was at the perfect moment, a set time planned by God. Now we can say... We can say that the set time means many things. It means that the Roman Empire had established roads and bridges and relatively safe travel, making it possible for the gospel to spread rather easily. We can say that Greek culture had established a common language, making it linguistically easier to share the gospel. We can say that, you know, that, the, that the, the people in the time there had, gotten, had grown weary of the Roman mythical gods and they were ready for real truth. All of that can be said and all of that is true. However, in the plan of God with absolute biblical conviction, with absolute certainty, we can say that Jesus came at the right time when the law of Moses had done the work of preparing for Jesus to come. The law of Moses had prepared people for the coming of the Messiah. Galatians 3, 23 and 24. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so when? When did the Father send Jesus when the set time had come, the time that he had determined in before creation in eternity. When all the work of preparation had been done, Jesus came. God had prepared humanity according to his perfect plan for Jesus to come. Okay? So the next question, what? Okay, what did, what, what, what did God do? Galatians 4 and 4 again, God sent his son. Okay? He sent his son. So at the right time, when, what, God sent who, his son. He did not send an idea. He did not send an apparition or a ghost. He didn't send an angel. He sent his son. Why? Because the set time had fully come. That's why he sent him. Importance. Now, it's very, very important when we're looking at this to understand, and this is where you've got to wake up, the Trinity. Now, let's just be honest. We can't fully understand the Trinity. To think that you can fully understand the Trinity is to say that you can fully understand God. And that is a very, very, very arrogant statement to make. You cannot fully understand. and uh, the, 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 the finite cannot understand the infinite. It's just not possible. But I'm going to give you some theology here, and I hope you can grasp it. Okay, I hope I can explain this well. But it's very important for us to understand the Trinity. Again, that sounds like more and more piece of a puzzle, Vance. But I'm going to try to explain it. Because it's impossible to understand the work of Christ in relationship to the will of God outside of the Holy Trinity. Okay? 
The Holy Trinity states, it's a biblical fact, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are both co-eternal and co-equal. Okay? Three in one. They're co-eternal and they're co-equal. And at some time in pre-creation eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit entered into a covenant with one another. And in this covenant, they determined that one member of the Holy Trinity will become the Savior of the sins of humanity that they're about to create. See, they knew. I mean, this is, you know, we talked about this a little bit in the Sunday school class. It's amazing to me they knew. Okay? Adam and Eve's failure in the Garden of Eden did not surprise God. Okay? He knew they were going to sin. He knew what it was going to lead to. He knew that because of their sin, that separation would take place, and he was going to have to send the Son to pay for their sin and endure his wrath so that they could be reconciled, and he created us anyway. Why? Love. I mean, if you don't think God loves you, you are blind to what love really is. It's amazing. So he came up with this, that, and it determined that one of them had to go and save humanity. This role was given to the Son who in willful submission, willful submission, to the Father agreed that when the time was right, when the set time had come to do the Father's will, he would come and he would be delighted to come. Then, the promise of the Father to the Son, after completing the task of redeeming humanity, is that during his earthly life that the Father would uphold him And also, at the completion of his task, the Father would reward him. That the Son, who would experience such suffering and agony of his soul, would see the fulfillment of his purpose, the fulfillment of his coming, in those who would believe in him. In other words, you and me. Okay? In accordance with the plan that the Trinity had before creation. That is the Trinity. That is amazing. That is unbelievable. That is incredible. That is, I mean, that should make our heads almost explode. Now, I know some of you maybe already happened. That's okay. It's the thing that we got to grasp hold of. It's the thing that we got to understand. That the, we're not just the products of, of, of a spontaneity or of, of, of chance. That we're the, we're, the, we're the result of a plan by the creator of heaven and earth, by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was set before we were ever created, before God ever said let there be light he was thinking about you and me about a people that he would redeem as his own and adopt them as his family you're not just some kind of casual person drifting in an endless universe you're a plan of God now that might seem really 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 far away from a manger in Bethlehem. But listen carefully. The significance of the manger can only be fully understand when you see how it fits into the puzzle. It fits into God's plan. And many who reject Christmas do so because they don't understand how it fits. And they think it's irrelevant. And it seems irrelevant largely because of the way preachers like myself have often proclaimed it, and we have often proclaimed it and make it sound somewhat unrelevant, irrelevant. And our poor explanations of this amazing event leaves many people to believe that there's nothing there for them. But when we think through what the Bible tells us in light of all of Scripture and see beyond our human ability into a spiritual realm that is unknown to us, And carefully consider this idea that the creator of the universe, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, enters into a plan in eternity where the Father sends the Son to save us. Well, that changes Christmas altogether. That takes our attention away from our decorations, our shopping, our gifts, and our simple sentimental ideas of Christmas. 
That's what Christmas is about. The Father sent the Son, and the Son came gladly. You can read some basically, you know, heretical books that say that Jesus was forced to come, that Jesus didn't want to come. Jesus came willingly. Philippians chapter 2 shows that very, very clearly. He was not forced against his will. He came because he delighted to do the Father's will. Yes, he had a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where his humanity you know, flinched at what it was about to face and the whole, the whole thing of you know, a perfectly holy being you know, becoming the sin of the world and he flinched. But he didn't, he didn't, he didn't ever, one moment, not for one second, think I'm not going to do what the Father wants. He said, right, right, the same thing that we should say every day of our life, God, your will be done, not mine. So, so far our summary. When was this? When the time had fully come. What was happening? God sent. Who? His son. How? How does the son being sent unfold? Well, again, Galatians 4, verses 4, the second part. Okay? Born of a woman, born under the law. Well, what does that mean? Okay? Born of a woman. This is easy. Okay? This, is, this, this, this one's easy. Born of a woman. It's just a reminder to us and to the readers of Galatians that he was fully God but also fully man born of a woman Jesus Christ was 100 it wasn't 50-50 he was 100% God and he was 100% man now he did empty himself of some things okay he was no longer omnipresent he couldn't be everywhere at one time but he was still 100% God he was not an apparition. He was not a ghost. He was human. His biochemical composition was exactly the same as yours and mine. His anatomy was the same as any man at this time or, in, or since. He had the same central nervous system as you and I do, making him the same, have the same sensitivity to pain as you and I do. What you and I would have felt if they did to him, did to us what they did to him on the cross is what he felt. He needed to eat. He needed to sleep. All those things. He was human. Now, if you're skeptical about the story of Christ being true, then ask yourself this question. If you were going to invent a religion, is this really what you'd come up with? I mean, think about it. I mean, if you wanted to make up your own religion and get as many followers as you possibly could, because that's what you do in religion, you want as many followers as you can, is this what you would do, what you would come up with to get people to follow you? Really? I mean, I think only if you were trying to make it as unbelievable as possible. And I would argue with any skeptic, any non-believer, that it is the unbelievable aspects of the Christian story that make it so believable. Okay, so born under, a, born under a woman, he was human. Born under the law. Now this gets a little bit more complex. Born under the law. When reading the Bible, it's very, very important that we keep the Bible in its context. That we don't forget the verses that come after and the verses that come before. Now there is lots of scripture that can be taken and used by themselves. Okay? I can do all things in Christ. Well, you've got to take that within context because if you think you can do all things in Christ, then build me a roof this afternoon. Okay? In one day. No, it, it's talking about specific things that we can do in Christ. All right? And so but, and we have to consider the context here. And to, 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 to take Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, out of its context is dangerous. Especially because of this statement, born under the law. So I'm going to summarize for you a little bit, especially chapter 3 of Galatians. Chapter 3 says a lot about the law of Moses, which of course we know is, summarizing, is summarized in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is basically a summary of the law. And Paul tells us when God comes to earth in the person of Jesus, he has a human mother, he lives a human life, and he was born under the authority of the law of Moses, the law of God. That means Jesus was not free to do whatever he wanted. 
but he, ha- he was here to do what the law demands. To love the Lord his God with all his heart, all his soul, all his strength, all his mind. To love others as himself. To be absolutely truthful in what he says. To be absolutely faithful in his relationships. To be absolutely committed to the things and the ways of God. Because only if he was perfect could he fulfill the law. Only because he perfectly fulfilled all the requirements and demands of the law can he represent us, the people he came to save. We talked about before, he is our high priest. He represents us. No one, no one has ever kept the Ten Commandments perfectly except for Jesus. No one. No one. And because he did, he can represent us. But also, no one could consume the penalty of sin, could consume God's wrath against sin that falls on those who have broken the law, but Jesus, who in his death took the penalty of the law on himself. And so not only is he our representative, he is also our substitute. And we talked about that before in the Union with Christ series, that he is our high priest, but he is also our sacrificial lamb. He is our representative, but he is also our substitute. Both of those require perfection. He could only represent us if he perfectly fulfilled the law. He could only be a substitute if he was a lamb without blemish. Perfect. He could not represent us unless under the law he was absolutely sinless. He could not be our substitute lamb unless he can bear in himself all the penalty that falls on those who break the law, which is us, sinners. And you say, Vance, what does this have to do with Christmas? If you look in the manger into the eyes of that little baby and walk away thinking, oh, how sweet. It gives me such nice feelings. Makes me want to call my grandchildren. Wrap a gift. Put, some, put the stockings on the tree. Then you missed it completely. When you look into the eyes of the one lying in the manger... You look into the eyes of a child that as he grew to manhood had to live in total perfection for you so that he could represent you. And that he had to die as a substitute for you in total agony and suffering so that you could have life with Christ. Let us not think that we can casually consider the Christmas story, throw some money in the Salvation Army bucket, buy the family and the friends some gifts, and think that we understand it and that we live it. Can't do that. In Galatians, Paul is explaining all of this by discussing three people in history. Three people. He's discussing Abraham, who represents the promise, Moses, who represents the law, and then Christ, the one who brings them meaning together. Abraham, the promise. We'll talk about that first. And I know this is, this is a little, you know, maybe more than you expected. Good. We're having T-bone today, okay? So if you like steak, put some A1 on it and let's go. Or if you don't like A1, put something else. I don't know. If you read Galatians chapter 3, and I know you're going to do that for homework because you're good Christian people. That's called a guilt message if you didn't pick up on it. You will see that Paul is reminding the Christians in Galatia that God made a promise to Abraham. Okay? This is a very often misquoted promise that you hear a lot of people make in the church, but he made it in Genesis chapter 12. It's known as the Abrahamic covenant. God tells Abraham that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's seed, his children. Specifically, what he's referring to is the Messiah, all right? And and God makes this promise with no strings attached. Read it in Genesis 12. There's no strings attached. There's no commands. There's no laws. There's no conditions whatsoever. In fact, the law did not come until 430 years after the promise. We see that in Galatians 3, 17. Paul says, what I mean is this. The law 
introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant or the promise previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. What Paul is saying there is that the law did not eliminate the promise. So then how does the promise given to Abraham and the law given to Moses fit together? How do we put this piece in the puzzle? I mean, is it, that, is it a promise that we embrace? Or is it a law that we obey? I mean, which is it? And now we're talking about for salvation here. Which is it? For if it's a promise, then it's not a law. And if it's a law, it's not a promise. I mean, basically what we're talking about here is salvation by grace, promise, or salvation by works, law. I mean, is Jesus telling us that since he lived a perfect life, now we're supposed to live a perfect life? And even though he knows we can't live a perfect life, we should try to live a perfect life, and when we get to heaven, he'll grade us on how we did. Is that what Jesus is telling us in the Gospels? Or is he telling us, if you will trust in me and what I have done as your representative and as your substitute, that you will be welcome in my eternal presence? Now, do keep in mind here, I'm not talking about unconditional eternal security. I'm not teaching that, you know, teaching that you can say a prayer at one time in your life and then live your life however you want. I'm not teaching that at all. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Okay? Obedience isn't optional because obedience is love. You can't tell me you believe in Jesus and then you don't follow Jesus. I mean, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. And actually, even the word for belief in Scripture means an active belief, a pursuing, a following, that we are disciples, apprentices of the Lord Jesus. So you know, I want that to be very, very clear. But the answer of promise to the law is answered to us in the next verse, verse 18. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in His grace... Gave it to Abraham through a promise. Promise is by grace. Salvation is by grace. So then the next logical question that we should ask, why was the law given? Why did, you know, if God gave this law, this promise to Abraham that he was going to send the Savior, why give the law? Why do that? And he gave Moses, we know, the law. What does the law do? It exposes sin. And that's what we desperately, desperately, desperately need. We need to have our sin exposed. Now, I've said this many times. The person that you lie to the most is yourself. The person that you deceive most is yourself. Because you tell tell yourself, I'm okay. I'm okay. I mean, you meet people in the world. They think they're okay. I'm good. That's the lie. That's the lie that we tell ourselves all our time. I'm okay. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm a reasonably nice guy. I treat my wife and kids good. I pay my taxes. Occasionally, I wave at my neighbor. I put up a Christmas tree. I gave to the Salvation Army. I even bought my boss a gift. I'm fine. I'm good. But then, you open the law. You read or have the law preached to you in church. And what does it say to you? Well, I'm not as fine as I thought I was. I'm not as good as I think. In fact, as I read through the Word of God, I I realize I'm a lawbreaker. I'm a sinner. How do I know that? Because the law reveals it to me. The law reveals my sin. It tells me, for example, to have no other gods before God. But I do sometimes, don't I? Well, you know, last week I, I put money before God. Last week I, I put my job before God. Right now I'm putting my family before God. I, I put sports before God. I put myself before God. I'm trusting in a lot of things, but God ain't one of them. What about adultery? Well, I don't, I've never done that. You ever lust? Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully in your heart, you have committed adultery. What about murder? Oh, I've never killed anyone. Have you ever hated somebody? Jesus said, if you look at your brother with hate, it's like killing them. 
Lie, covet, we could go on and on and on. You say, well, I never lie. You just did. And the thing about it is, is we've grown so used to doing this, it doesn't even bother us anymore. That's why you come into church, you think you're okay, you think you're fine, and then you hear the preaching of the law of Christ. And suddenly you realize, uh-oh, he's talking to me. But guess what? It ain't Vance talking to you. It's Christ talking to you. Telling you, hey, you're not okay. You're not all right. Guess what? You need a Savior. Your sin is exposed by the law. The promise given to Abraham by God is fulfilled perfectly in Christ. The law given to Moses by God was fulfilled perfectly by Christ. The law is not given to provide salvation. The law was given to convince us that we need salvation. As we go through life, we don't think we need a Savior. When is the last time you were at Walmart looking for whatever you eat, I don't know, chips. And you're standing by another person looking for chips. And they look at you and they say, pardon me, excuse me, where can I find a Savior? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever walked up to the counter at McDonald's and they say, do you know where I can find a Savior? No, we don't say that. We don't think that. What do we say? I'm fine. I'm good. I'm okay. What is the world saying now? It's fine. It's good. Just let people think what they want and do what they want. Isn't that tolerance? So how in the world are people going to find out that they're not fine, that they're not good, that they're not okay? How are you going to know that if all you hear when you come to church is, I have a promise for you? I have a promise for you, and I have a promise for you, and I have a promise for you. If that's all they ever hear, if that's all you ever hear when you come to church, how in the world are you going to know that you still need a Savior? Because you're not okay. But the promise is that Jesus is our Savior. You say, so what? I'm fine. I don't need a Savior. Because if you think you're fine and you think you're okay, you don't even realize you need Jesus. Then, then, let me tell you about the law. So you preach and teach and read the law of Christ, and they realize, oh, I do need a Savior. Why do you think I preach the way I do? I want you to be confronted with the law of Christ so that it will reveal and expose your sin and my sin. Not so we feel condemned. Because then, after that sin has been revealed, then I want to show you the promise that you have one who came and died on your behalf, born of a virgin, in a manger, in Bethlehem, lived a perfect life under the law, suffered a horrible death, became a perfect sacrifice, resurrected after three days, ascended into heaven to save you. And that salvation is not just one moment in your history when you knelt in a church somewhere or in a living room somewhere or a coffee shop. You need a Savior every single day. And so the reason that I preach the way I do is so week after week I can expose the sin that is still in us and then show you the Savior that can take it all away. Yes, there is an amazing promise, but if your sin is not exposed, you won't ever realize you need it. You must know you need a Savior before you will grasp the promise that there is a Savior, that you have a Savior in Jesus. Okay, Maybe you come in here on a Sunday, looking back at the past week, 
or the past month thinking, I got a B this week, maybe a B plus on the exam. I'm doing pretty good. And then you hear the preaching of the law of Christ. And suddenly, your eyes are open a little bit. And you realize, well, I don't have a B. I don't even have a C. You know, to be honest, I don't even have a D. I'm failing this class completely. But if you're going to judge, if, you're going to, if God is going to judge you on the basis of the law, and you have an F on the exam... How in the world are you going to stand before him? I know what you're going to say if you're you're thinking this through. I have no idea. I can't. I'm not fine. I need help. I need saved. I need a savior. Then let me tell you about the promise of God. It's only when a person is confronted by the law of Christ that they realize their sin and their need of a savior that the promise that God is willing to do something for them that they cannot possibly do for themselves. They need a promise, a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So summary, so far, and we're going to have this on the screen. This is where we are so far. So in this text, when? When the set time had fully come. What? God sent. Who did he send? His son. How? Born of a woman, born under the law. Why? To save, save and redeem means the same thing. And adopt. In Philippians chapter 2, this is not on the screen, but it can be summed up basically this way. Jesus, who was a son by nature, took the role of a servant so that those of us who by nature are servants of sin may be adopted as sons as the result of his grace. That's the gospel. This is why you can't understand Christmas without Calvary. There is a song. Now, I'm, 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 I have to admit, I'm like Brent. I'm not very fond of Christmas music. Silent Night, that's about it. I like, and I like the little drummer boy for some strange reason. I, I really don't know why. I used to love that little cartoon with the claymation, you know. I, I would probably still watch that. I mean, but I love Silent Night, but I'm not a big Christmas music person. But there is a Christmas song. <laughs> and I, I started to warn Brent just to make sure that he didn't sing it, uh, called Mary's Boy Child. I think Harry Bustafanti or somebody like that come up with it. And on the, in that song, it has a statement, because I actually read what we're singing, that man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. That is not true. That's not true. Man will live forevermore, Because God created him as an eternal being. The question is not, are you going to live forever? You will live forever. You were created to live forever. The question is, where? Will you live with God in heaven, or you live without God in hell? And how can we determine If we're going to heaven and not to hell, on what we find in the manger on Christmas morning. It is only by recognizing, believing that in the manger God has sent one to us that bears the curse and penalty that you and I deserve. Jesus came to fulfill the law voluntarily, taking upon himself a, a, a curse. While you and I voluntarily fail to fulfill the law, face a curse that we can't get out of. I got really, really bad news for you about Christmas. You are cursed and ain't nothing you can do about it. Merry Christmas. But I got good news also. A Savior has been sent. A child has been born in Bethlehem. There ain't nothing you can do about how lost you are, how cursed you are, but a Savior's been sent. Hallelujah. Now, there's three groups of people, and I know what time it is. I'm trying to hurry. Three groups of people who are often at church. The first group, second group, and third group. We're going to talk about each one. First group. This is a group that never really trusted in Christ. They might have been in church their whole life, but they never really trusted in Christ. And the reason that they never trusted in Christ is that they never have had the law preached to them the right way. They come to church, and preachers like me 
don't make it clear to them. We tell them that Jesus is the answer, but they don't even know the question. And they think, well, Jesus is no answer to me at all. These people don't need a lot of promise. They need a lot of law. Why? The law shows them their sin. They need the law to come in and break them, expose their sin, so that they can see who they really are, remove the lie that they're okay, and that they need a Savior. They need to be aware of the fact, and all of us do, that one day we will all stand before God, and we need to be humbled, afraid, and broken, so that we will all come and seek God's grace through Christ. And we will not do that until we are broken. When did you accept Christ? When everything in your life was great? When you had no problems, had no worries, your bank account was full, you were healthy and happy, everything was great, no problems, no trials, no tribulations? Not very likely. When I came to Christ, I'd lost everything. I was trying to kill myself. I'd reached total despair. The room of my possessions was empty, and the only thing that was still there was Jesus Christ. And at that moment, I realized I need a Savior because I can't save myself. People need to be aware of the fact, again, that we're going to stand before God. I mean, this is what makes my job, my position, powerless. You might not think this, but I think I have the most difficult task on this planet. I believe that. It's why I go home depressed on Sundays, discouraged on Mondays. I mean, if I could talk people into it, I got a good IQ. I'm an educated person. I could talk people in about anything. I'd probably be a good salesman. Used to work for the GNC. I could sell you vitamins that wouldn't do anything and make you think they're going to make you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was younger. If I could talk people into it, force them in some way, coerce them somehow, if I could come up to you and slap you with a Bible, crush your hardened heart, but I can't. It doesn't work. I can only preach the best I know how. Explain it the best I can. Warning you with all the earnestness that I can muster, hoping that somehow the proclamation of the law of Christ will soften your hard heart enough that you see your need of Him and bring you to repentance. Until you and I realize that we are imprisoned and lost in sin by the preaching of the law of Christ, we will never come to Him to be free. Why do you think the church is dying in the world today, in our country today? Because church after church are just preaching the promise. They're not preaching about sin anymore. They're not preaching about the law that shows us our sin. And we need that because it shows us that we need a Savior. Until you're driven to despair of yourself, you will never ever come to trust Christ. Why would you trust in Christ if you trust in yourself? Only when you see it is hopeless to trust in yourself will you ever consider trusting in Jesus. And until then, this Christmas will be just another Christmas. Maybe some decorations, maybe some gifts, maybe a little money in the bucket, maybe some cheer, and you will continue to miss the meaning of Christmas and continue to live in eternal danger. The second group, I know what time it is. I'm not very hungry. No, I, I want to get through this. The second group is exactly the verse, reverse of the first group. These are people who've had the law preached to them a lot. Their sin has been fully exposed. They have been break it, broken. They're aware of their sin. Now they need to grasp the promise. These people are miserable in their commitment to the rules. They don't understand 
that God gave them the law to expose their sin in order to drive them to their Savior. They've only heard the preaching of the law in such a way that doesn't drive them to Christ. It drives them to despair. I'm, I remember this. I grew up under this type of preaching. Law without promise does that. If all you preach is sin and you don't provide the Savior, all you're going to have is a church full of despair. You need to hear that God gave the law, not so you could earn your acceptance by proving you are holy, but he gave the law to prove you're a sinner so that you will seek him for the acceptance that he gives, which makes you holy. Again, we don't, we don't, we don't try to earn holiness. We are holy because of what Christ done, and now we need to live in holiness, live in that acceptance. When we realize what we are, only then will we realize why the baby in the manger was sent to us. And you've ever thought about this? What a strange place for God to show up. Now, I love nativity scenes. You can talk about their historical validity all you want. I don't care. I have nice, nice nativity scenes, and I ain't getting rid of the wise men for nothing. I have two from Bethlehem that I'm very, very fond of. One, for some reason, has a little bit of dirt in Bethlehem. Like, I, like, I don't know why. But what a strange place for God to show up among the cows and the camels and the stench and the rugged shepherds. I mean, who would look for God in such a place? A manger? A cross? What's that all about? It's about the promise. So we have the first group who have never realized that their plight, realize that they're, they're in trouble, they think they're okay, and we have the second group have embraced the law, but they think they're holy on the strength of what they do, and they live in absolute misery. The third group, after hearing the law, recognize their helplessness and their desperate need of a Savior. They have went to Christ and found the promise made to Abraham is theirs by God's grace, and now seek to obey God because they love and appreciate the one who was sent. And who gave the promise. So my question today, which group are you in? Are you in the first group where you think you're okay? All this preaching on sin, I'm okay. Are you in the group that lives in total despair because you're trying to actually earn this? You can't earn this. You could have earned it. He wouldn't have been sent. If it was just a matter of fulfilling the law, we're, we're in big trouble. I don't know about you. I can't do it. I can't. I get angry sometimes for no reason, especially when I'm driving. Anytime it involves a tractor. Like I'm sure that farmer ain't got nothing better to do than annoy me that day. I don't always have the best attitude with my family. Not always the best husband. I'm definitely not the best pastor. I grumpy, especially in the morning. Which group are you in? You think you're fine, okay, not realizing that you're in eternal danger. Or you embrace the law but live in misery because you can't fulfill it, because you can't earn it, can't deserve it. I hope that today you understand that today you understand that he was sent and that I have to proclaim the law of Christ so that it will expose your sin, not to condemn you, not so that you can try to live up to it, not so that you can be in misery because you can never fulfill the law of Christ perfectly. Only Jesus could do that but that it exposes your sin so then I can point you to the Savior. That's why. That's what we need. When we look into the manger on Christmas morning, 
may that be what we see, our hope. Our hope. I'm a sinner, the chief of sinners, a wretch. But when the time, the set time had come, God sent his son. And I have a savior. And every time the law of God exposes my sin, whether it's in this church, listening to a preacher that I like, reading or studying the Bible for myself, and suddenly I realize, oh no, I'm not okay. Oh no, my sin is exposed. God has searched my heart and revealed to me something. I don't have to be in despair. I don't have to say, oh no, I've done it again. I don't have to say, what am, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I such a pathetic person? No, why? Because God sent his son and I have a savior. And every time the word of Christ, the law of Christ reveals my sin, I can run to Jesus. Knowing that if I confess my sin, that he is just and forgive me in my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Now, I know in this church, we have people in all three groups. If you're in the first group, look, wake up before it's too late. If you're in the second group, look at Jesus. No, you're not perfect. And you never will be. There was only one who was perfect. Now, that doesn't mean we accept our sin. That doesn't mean we just say, oh, I can't beat it, so I'm just going to just join it. No. It means that day after day after day, and if it has to be minute after minute after minute, we run to the manger. We run to the cross. Please stand. What is God saying to you this morning? I apologize that we went past 12 The other churches will be out of the restaurant the time you get there, so it's a good thing. But what is God saying to you? I'd like for you to bow your heads. If you're here today, and the word of God being preached has exposed your sin, you realize there's something in you. It could be anything. Lust, gossip, lying, bad attitude, pride, on and on and on and on. But the law, the law of Christ has exposed it. That's good. Because let me tell you about Jesus, which I just did. He'll forgive you. You say, but you don't know what I did. You don't know what I do. I mean, I've been faking this whole church thing for a long, long, long time. It's all right. Run to Jesus. He's still your Savior. Or you're in the second group, and every Sunday all you hear is the law. Again and again and again, and you walk around and you just feel miserable because you're trying so hard to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, to live the perfect life. And day after day after day, you fail and you fail and you fail. Run to the Savior. Or maybe you're in the third group. Your sin's exposed and you've repented. You've, you keep running to the Savior. Then rejoice and run to the Savior. And thank Him that He was sent and that He came so willfully. If you're here this morning and you'd like to pray, the altars are open. I'm not going to have a specific altar call. You pray as you like. You pray as long as you like. But if you're here today, and again, I'd like for you to close your eyes. This just helps people a little bit if they think no one's going to see them. And you realize you're lost. I mean, I'm not talking about that you've become a Christian and you've, you've messed up a little bit and you've sinned and, you know, you just can't get it right. That's not what I'm talking about. You're lost. Your soul is at risk. If you leave this church today and you die... You will spend eternity without God in hell. There won't be any second chances. The offer has been made. 
The baby came. If I'm talking to you, then I ask for you to raise your hand. Just very quickly and put it back down. You don't have to make some kind of public statement. I won't make you do that. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just raise your hand and put it back down. Is there anybody? Anyone? All right. But if you're in any of the other groups... You may be in the group that gets tired of hearing the law preached because you think you're okay. Realize that it's out of love that it is proclaimed. Because unexposed sin would not be me loving you, would not be God loving you. He exposes our sin because He loves us. If you're the person who maybe you've heard this preached all your life and you're miserable, because you can't live up to it. It's all right. You can't live up to it. That's why we have Christ. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. There's been only one. Run to Jesus. Accept what he's done for you. Accept that you can't earn it. You can't deserve it. And if you've got this figure it out for now. I can tell you that sometimes we go in and out of these groups. And if you got it good for now, embrace Him and just thank Him. Jesus, thank you so much that you weren't just my Savior 20 or 30 or years ago, that you're my Savior today. And that when you, my sin is exposed, you're still there. And all I got to do is ask for forgiveness and you'll forgive me. I mean, it's in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those who've sinned against me. And help me to do that because you're my Savior today as much as you've ever been and you'll be my Savior tomorrow. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you how you gave us the law to expose our sin, not to make us feel guilty and condemned, but that we can come to you, our Savior. Having our sin exposed is actually a good thing, a wonderful thing, a beautiful thing, because if it's not exposed, we will die in our sin. But as it is preached, as it is read, as it is, as it is proclaimed, it, it comes to light, it comes visible to us. We see it, and then we can run to you and have forgiveness and be cleansed by your amazing love and your amazing grace. And that doesn't just happen once in our life. It happens daily regularly, frequently. And may we never think that you, Jesus, our Savior, grow tired of us coming to you asking to be forgiven. You don't. I know every day I come to you and say, God, forgive me for this or forgive me for that. Every day it seems to be something else. But I know by your word, I know because of your character, because of who you are, that every day I am greeted with open arms and loved and forgiven. And this is what Christmas is all about. And as we go forward and we celebrate God sending His Son, may we not lose sight of this. And all the other things, there's nothing wrong with the celebrations. There's nothing wrong with trees and stockings and gifts and all those things. But that we never lose sight of the one in the manger knowing that he's the same one that's on the cross. Amen. Let's pray our benediction. May the words of our mouth and this meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and my prayer for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day. Don't forget your little devotional uh, as you go out.